Israelite and find your place in Psalm 139. I'm going to read a text from that passage if you'll find your place there. The Bible begins there and says, O Lord, Thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down-sitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compass my path and my lying down and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. You know, we live in a unique day, and probably like no other time, people that we don't know know a lot about us. Uh, we have cameras that are posted in places that probably you wouldn't even think about. You go to the ATM, of course, you might expect there they would have a camera. You pump your gas at a, 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 a gas station, they're having cameras on you. You're walking down the street, different stores have security cameras, and uh, there's all types of uh, surveillance that takes place, and we've be really just become accustomed to it. Uh, we look at our computer, and uh, now you almost get used to it. I can remember the first few times it happened to me. I was taken back. Uh, I went to fill out a form online, and before I know it, all my address and everything's already filled out for me. And I thought, well, who knew what my address was? But uh, the knowledge that people have about us, probably like no other time, is great in our society. You know, if you ever been to a, uh, a fair, and you go up to a, a scale, and it says, well, guess your weight or guess your age, um, you think, well, how can they do that? I mean, how are they going to just look at me and tell how old I am exactly or how much weight? And sometimes they'll be wrong, but it's really kind of a funny feeling when you go up and they say you're this old and you weigh this much, and they're dead right. Uh, we've got, of course, uh, you could call the psychic network. Um, I don't know that they genuinely know much about you, but uh, they're talented people that begin to ask you questions that, that are very obvious. But, you know, it's really a remarkable thing uh, as much knowledge as is out there and as uncomfortable as we might be that somebody know too much about us, I read this passage and I find that there is a two-edged sword that God knows all about us. You know, it's a very comforting thought to think that God is with me watching and aware of everything that I do or think. It's also a very sobering thought to think that God is with me all the time. When I come to this psalm in Psalm 139, we are like probably no other place in the Bible confronted with the fact that we have a God who knows everything. Of course, the Bible reminds us in places like Proverbs 16, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. Over in the book of Chronicles, it talks about the eyes of the Lord are in every place to show himself strong on behalf of those that fear him. But here we have a psalm where the psalmist stops and he contemplates and thinks about it and says, really, as I stop and consider that God knows me better than I know myself, he makes the statement, as he says in verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain unto it. It really is beyond our comprehension to consider how much God knows about us. Now, several things I notice in this passage that remind me of the fact of God and His knowledge of who I am. First of all, I want you to note that God knows who you are. Now, David emphasizes this when he says, Thou hast searched me and known me. He's not just talking about his talents or his abilities. He's talking about the very core of David's person. He says, Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Now, it's one thing for God to look down at man and to see man stand and to see man sit, to know that I've gone outside or I've stayed inside, to, to like a, a GPS in the sense that God could follow me and track me everywhere I go, but it goes much farther than that. David says that he understands my thought afar off. If I daydream, God knows what I'm daydreaming about. If I have an internal motive that I want to hide from every other person, God's familiar with it. I mean, God knows who I am. Now, with that, it reminds me that God, first of all, knows about my ways. That is literally the things that I do, the down-sitting, the uprising. As I mentioned before, the Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place, and they behold the evil and the good. Certainly, it's sobering to think that if I do wrong, 
There's an accountability to think that God is watching me. Certainly that's accountable. But it also reminds me and comforts me to know that wherever I go, God is with me. He is constantly there in His presence. Well, He not only knows my ways, He knows my will. You know, the Bible says in 1 Samuel 16, that well-known passage that's often misquoted, but the Bible there, when God was looking for a king and all of the great sons came through, the, the most uh, expected type person, uh, all of the, the sons came and, and one by one Samuel goes down the list and he says, not this one, not this one. Well, surely the anointed of the Lord is before you. I'm going to bring my best son. He says, don't you have another one? He says, because God, or man rather, looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. See, God knows beyond just what man sees, He knows our will. So He knows my ways, He knows my will, He knows my words. Everything that I say, God takes note of it. You know, I have read that the average person who speaks and maybe does a lot of talking, perhaps a salesman or somebody whose job is to talk, that likely says enough words every day to fill a large volume. And that in his lifetime, he will speak enough words to fill a whole college library. Well, you know, not a single word that man ever speaks will go past the knowledge of God Almighty. Matthew 12, 36, every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account of in the day of judgment. Now, David obviously is writing this in Psalm 139, not so much as a, a decree of uh, of gloom, not so much to say, hey, watch out what you say, watch out what you do, be careful. He writes it really in a comforting sense that, God, I know that I can't hide anything from you. I might as well come clean. I'm glad to know that a God that loves me knows who I am. Now, the only reason David could have that kind of a position before God is because I think about it like this. I could be really in awe as to what God does know about me. Well, let me tell you what I'm really in awe about today is what God forgot about me. Isaiah 38, it says that my sins have been cast behind the back of God. What if I had today to consider that God has known everything that I've said, done, or thought, and that I had to face Him with that? That'd be an awesome thought. I mean, to think that God would look down to every motive of my heart and I had to answer in His presence. But because of the Lord Jesus Christ, my sins have been cast behind His back. And no doubt David, as a man who had put his trust in God, who speaks of his righteousness that he had before the Lord, certainly not a perfect man, certainly a man with flaws, certainly a man we could look back and point to some areas of his life that he would not be proud of, and yet he was glad to be able to know that even though he was a sinner, because his sins had been dealt with, he was glad to know that God knew who he was. So certainly, uh, when we think about the knowledge of God, God knows who you are. But then I read a little bit further in this passage, and I note that God knows where we are. As I go down to verse 7, the question is asked, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I free, flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand hold me. Now, what I find in this passage, first of all, God introduces his omniscience. That is, he knows everything. I mean, here is an explicit passage in the Bible. It's not guesswork. We have it revealed that God literally knows everything that takes place, and especially even the thoughts of my heart. But now he goes even further that not only is God knowledgeable of all things, but God is omnipresent. He is everywhere. He said, if I make my bed in hell or if I send up to heaven, I mean, no matter where I go, up, down, or in between, you're already there. Now, God is a big God. The Bible does teach that He's immense. I think of Isaiah 40 where it talks about God stretched out the heavens like a curtain. I mean, how big are the heavens? How far apart are the stars? I mean, we have to measure it in light years. 
We measure it in how far you can travel at the speed of light. How many years would it take you to reach a star that we're looking at on a telescope? When God got ready to stretch it out, if you want to know how big it was, it's like he walked up to the window and and said, and that's how big he is. God's a big God. But now don't get in in your mind that God, because he's so big, and when David says, if I ascend down to hell, he's there. If I go up to heaven, he's there. That doesn't mean that God's foot is down here in hell and that his head's up here in heaven, and that his arm's over here on this side of the universe. And he's, Now, he's big, but it also means that he, in his absolute presence and knowledge and being, is in every minute place that exists. Nothing gets beyond his eye. He's there. He is omnipresent. God is in this room right now. The Bible says where two or three are gathered in his name, Jesus said, there will I be in the midst. He didn't imply that he wasn't there in the sense of deity. He meant that if you gather in his name, he's going to come meet with you. Hey, I guarantee you he's not meeting with people on a spiritual level in a bar room tonight. Of course, I guess nobody's meeting in a bar tonight if they're uh, not allowed to go. But he's normally not going to go meet with people in their dens of sin. But he is there. You can't go where God is not. Now, let's think for a moment as a believer because, again, David's perspective here is not so much one of all and uh, imagine of a, a, a idea of him putting him in a place where he's afraid that God is there. He's pleased that God is there. Do you know the Christian has every reason to be glad that God's presence is there? You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 13, 5, the promise, uh, let your conversation be without covetousness, be with content with such things as you have, for he hath said, he will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, that's a promise to the believer. Now, God's there in his presence. And you know, the presence of God can be sought. You know, as a believer, that's exactly what we ought to do. It's ironic to think that God is everywhere. And yet, I'm told in the Bible to seek his face. You know, the Bible reminds us, uh, Paul had this prayer in Philippians 3.10. He said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering. I think about Psalm 16 where the psalmist predicting, of course, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, but he says, in thy presence is fullness of joy. To be able to walk with God and to know him, listen, it is comforting to me to know that God is already there. I'm not trying to get him to come to me. I need to go to him. I need to walk with him. You see, the, uh, God is everywhere, but yet he tells us in his presence he can be sought. But you know, God can also be sensed. You know, it's one thing to know very concretely. I've got truth from the Bible. I can go to this book and I can find out that God is omniscient. I can find out that he's omnipresent. I can read the truth in the word of God that he loves me, that Jesus died for me, that he came out of the grave. I can read these promises that I can go to him in prayer and that I can ask. Now, I take those promises and I file them away. I make them part of my soul. But that's, a, that's, that's the first step toward walking with God is, is seeking him in knowledge. But you know, when I say that God can be sensed, that's the subjective side. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Bible says his spirit or the spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know, the Holy Ghost can give me a not only an uh, a intellectual idea of his presence, but a sense of his presence. You know, that's the grace of God. The grace of God comforts. The grace of God, by the Spirit's power, gives us a sense that God is with us. So the presence of God can be sought. The presence of God can be sensed. But you know, the presence of God can be severed. Now, I want to know him better. I want to walk with him. I want to get to know him. I want to find the intellectual uh, truth of God that would cause me to know him. I want to sense the Spirit of God speaking to me and meeting with me in prayer. But how is the relationship severed? Psalm 66, 18, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You know, what we need today as believers is we need a thirst to walk with God. I mean, a real desire to say, God, I am not going to be the testimony I ought to be every day. 
I'm not going to be the father I ought to be every day or the mother. I'm not going to be the citizen that, that would have the right kind of testimony. I'm not going to be the, the type of church member that would be effective. I mean, whatever state it is, I desperately need to walk with God so that I might be in a position to know Him better that I can be at His disposal. But you know, often the devil comes in sees the potential for these hands to be used for God, sees the potential for these eyes to be used for God, we may well intention and say, boy, I'm heading in the right direction. But let me tell you that Satan is the great distractor. The devil will try to distract you. The devil will try to take your attention off of a walk with the Lord because if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But on the positive side of that, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. You know, God speaks to me through His Word. Do you know that when I respond to the light of God's Word, I fellowship with God? You know, there might be somebody who's newly saved. All kinds of baggage in their life. I mean, to them, they sit down and the Bible all of a sudden confronts them with something as simple as uh, meditating in the Bible. And maybe for the first time, they say, well, you know, God wants me to read His Word. And they might not read but two verses and go to bed, but they've responded to the Spirit of God working in their heart. They're going to experience fellowship with God. But then here's somebody who's maybe a believer, been uh, saved for years. God doesn't quit speaking. You already have a certain amount of knowledge. God comes and He begins to maybe give you a new level of trust, maybe a new step of faith that you take in giving or a new step of faith you take in, in uh, witnessing for Jesus or a new step of faith you might take in just a matter of trusting God in the middle of a circumstance and God shows you something from the book and you, and you respond in your heart and say, yes, God, I'm going to take that step of faith and respond, you'll begin to fellowship with God. If we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and God would have us fellowship with Him. So the presence of God ought to be sought. The presence of God, of course, can be sensed. That is, there's a subjective side, and it can be severed. But it need not be if we walk in the light. So God knows who you are concerning His presence. But look at verse 10. It says, even there, that is, in this place, the wings of the morning where you dwell in the parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand hold me. Do you know that is a statement? of the providence of God? Do you realize that God is providentially in control of this world? Now, we can't blame everything bad that takes place on God. He is sovereign. He does control providence. But the devil is obviously a factor in this world. Man's free will is a factor in this world. I mean, here's somebody who's uh, out on the road and uh, they're just minding their own business. Maybe they're a family driving down the road to go to the grocery store and some drunk driver comes and wipes that family out and maybe in one fell swell swoop, the, the wife and the kids are all taken out and the husband, maybe he's at home, finds out his family's been wiped out. That's a terrible tragedy. Now somebody says, why in the world would God let something like that happen? If he's a loving God, how could that take place? I would say, why did that man go off and drink liquor and get in his car and drive? He's the one that made the mistake. Now, yes, God's in control, but man has a free will. But even in the midst of man's free will, man never shakes God out of his plan. Never shakes him up, never takes him back. God always has the answer. Proverbs 16, 9. A man deviseth in his heart, but the Lord directs his steps. Do you realize God is providentially over all things? Now, if I'm lost, I might be perplexed and to think, how are things going to turn out? Because even though God's over all things, God has given me a free will, and I'm not chose to follow Him. But when I receive the Lord Jesus Christ, and I become a child of God, just like David the psalmist prayed, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand hold me, Nothing takes God by surprise in the middle of every trial, every difficulty. Do you know God is not one bit concerned how this whole virus thing is going to turn out? He knows exactly what's going to happen, and in the midst of it, His children, believers, can come out on the other side better and bringing Him more glory than we went into it. 
I mean, he is overall, he is providentially in control. But then I also note, he says down in verse 11, If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day, and the darkness and the light are both alike to thee. You know, here we have a step out. David steps back and he says, you know, what if a person decides, I'm going to try to get away with something. I believe I can get in the dark and nobody will know it. You know, the Bible says men love darkness rather than light. That's both literal and spiritual. You know, most crimes, as I understand it, and I've read behind people have said this, I've never, I don't know it for a fact, but this is the statistic, most crimes take place at night. There's something about the cover of darkness that make men think nobody's going to know about this. Now, God doesn't see a difference between the dark and the light. He sees all things in broad daylight because God is light and in Him there is no darkness at all. The human heart says, I'm going to hide, and then we find that God sees and knows everything. It's a solemn thought. So I look at this and I see that God knows who you are. I read this passage and I see God knows where you are. And then finally, I notice in this passage that He knows what you are. This is a remarkable passage. He says in verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's wounds. Now, of course, your reins, it's like a horse's reins. God has the reins. That is, if I'm a believer, I'm his child. David was his child. And he says, you know, I can, like a horse, I can look over there and see some water. And I think I'm going to go to the water. But the owner says, no, it's not time to drink water. He pulls the reins. The horse might like to stop and say, I'm going to eat some grass. But the rider of the horse says, no, we're going to keep riding. See, God is in control of my reins. He owns them. He possesses them. Now, I'll admit to you, God will give us some play sometimes in those reins. Sometimes we might need to learn a lesson, and so he lets us go off for a little bit, but he's still got control of the reins. Now, God is speaking here about his control over our life. It says, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. You know, that's before I'm born. In my mother's womb. You say, when did that take place? Well, at conception. As soon as I was conceived, God already knew I'd be here before it started. But here we have a statement that as soon as I become reality, not the moment I'm born, not the moment I breathe my first breath, but in my mother's womb, God already has a plan for my life. You know, God has a plan for every person. Say, so what about a person's loss never comes to Jesus? Well, he, they got out of his plan. He has a will for your life. You didn't find it. Now, success is finding the will of God and doing it. He says, Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. But then he goes on. He says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. In verse 15, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. You know that word curiously wrought is, another, is translated in another place, embroidered. He literally, curiously embroidered and formed a human life. You know, it's just uh, ignorance, an absolute uh, refusal to see the truth, to look at a human body, how it's made up of cells, how the cells are made up of DNA, how every one of those cells knows what to do, when to divide. It starts off with just one cell, breaks in half, and it makes eyeballs and hands and liver and heart, and all of it just happened because the DNA just dictated it. Now, we didn't know that till a microscope came out, but God knew it, and he put it in the Bible that I was curiously wrought. I was embroidered in my mother's womb. Hey, God made the human body. Now, man fell. Sin came into the universe, but this is a remarkable statement about God's care for every individual. Do you realize that every person ever conceived in a womb, God is concerned about them? Now, the Bible says he's especially concerned about his children. He says, fear not, little flock. You have of, of more value than many sparrows. I mean, not even a sparrow falls to the ground without the knowledge of the Father. He clothes the grass of the field and 
Uh, it says even Solomon in all his glory wasn't like a lily of the field. God is concerned about every individual in the world. I mean, he says that in, in verse 14, I will praise thee for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You know, it's good for us to just stop sometimes and praise God for how he made us. Now, we all have flaws, some of them more obvious than others. You could scratch your head and you could say, well, why is this one person maybe born with a birth defect? Well, the fall of man, of course, caused some, some problems. But even in the midst of the fall, God has given us a world that is remarkably resilient. I mean, man does what he can. You know, people are worried about global warming. God made this earth. He said in the book of Genesis that as long as the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest and heat and cold are not going to end. Man's not going to stop the seasons from coming. He's not going to do that. He doesn't have that kind of power. Um, man's going to have some sicknesses. God's given us an immune system. And hey, thank God that he's given some knowledge. I'll guarantee you there's more uh, relief from a bad cold today than there was 100 years ago. I'm sure there's ways to fight pain and painkillers and things that we didn't have before. Uh, people uh, have some cures for diseases we've never had. Man has knowledge, and God uses that knowledge. But God made us as we are today. And the emphasis here is not just on the physical. I was curiously wrought in the lower parts of the earth. That is the mother's womb. Before I was ever born, God knows what I am. I mean, I am, a, I am important to God. You know, if a person really believed that they were important to God, they'd probably never even contemplate killing themselves. If a person really believed that every soul was important to God, certainly I don't think they would ever contemplate killing a baby before it's born. If a person really stopped and said, look, I'm not just some dot on a map. I'm not just the product of evolution. I'm not just a blob of cells that just happened here. God put me here for a reason. You may think you're the most insignificant, unknown person who nobody has ever heard of. Listen, do you realize you're more important to God today or just as important to God as any celebrity that you might think of? Matter of fact, if they're anti-God and atheist and opposed to this Bible and you're a believer in Jesus, you are a whole lot more important than they are. He has his eye on you today. The world might have their focus on some big name actor, celebrity, singer, but God has his eye on you. Hey, I'm important to him. You're somebody if you're a Christian. All that matters is you and God. You and God are a majority in any community. So God tells me that he looked down to the lower parts of the earth, and he says in verse 16, Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. They didn't even exist yet, but God knew about it. I mean, God already looked ahead in your life, and he sees the potential. Oh, yes, you say, well, what's God going to do if I don't end up doing exactly what he pointed out? Listen, I can get the blessing of getting in line with the will of God. But his plan is going to come through. Things are going to work out for him. If I want them to work out for me, I'll seek his will for my life. Now, I look at this passage, and I come to the conclusion that God knows me. He knows who I am, where I am, and what I am. Do you know him today? I hope we'll seek him. I hope we'll seek to walk with him because that's the only way we're going to find true fulfillment is to get to know him. Let's go ahead and have a closing prayer tonight. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the great truth of it, the great practicality of telling us how you know all about us and we need to know you. I dare say most folks tonight watching this live broadcast are believers and trusted you as Savior. May they be comforted in the thought that you know all about them, that you're with them. May we also as believers be challenged by the fact that you do see all that we do, that we have to answer to you even as a father. And then, Lord, for the lost world, the fact that Jesus died for every soul and wants them to come, wants him to come to him, them to come to him, I pray tonight that you'd convict their heart, show them their need, and even now that they would come to receive Jesus. Thank you for the service. In Jesus' name, amen.